Vielen Dank an das Exzellenzcluster Normative Orders, dessen Unterstützung es uns ermöglicht, die Reihe kostenlos zu präsentieren. Und auch an die HFMA, die Hessische Firma Medienakademie, die diese Reihe großzügig unterstützt hat. Ich möchte gerne auf unsere Pianistin heute Abend hinweisen. Ich möchte gerne unsere Pianistin jetzt schon im Vorfeld äh, vorstellen, Jerusa Miller. Jerusa Miller ist in Brasilien geboren und schon früh nach Frankfurt gekommen. Als gefragter Pianistin hat sie auch schon zahlreiche Stummfilme begleitet. Das heute ist ihr Debüt im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums. Und sie wird alle drei Titel begleiten. Ich finde es wunderbar, dass Jerusa hier ist und ich, jetzt spreche ich, jetzt ist der Ich wieder im Mark, würde es noch wunderbarer finden, wenn das Filmmuseum Jerusa auch für Filme engagieren wird, die Cross-Dressing nicht thematisiert. Nicht thematisieren. Drag Queen Klavierbegleitung tut jedem Stummfilm gut und tut jedem Filmmuseum gut. Die drei Filme in der Reihenfolge, ich möchte kein Mann sein, Zapatas Banda und das Liebes ABC lauf, laufen äh, direkt hintereinander weg. Ähm, es wird dunkel bleiben zwischen den Filmen und ähm, fast keine Unterbrechung geben. Und jetzt wechsle ich ins Englische. The more Lubitsch we watch, the better we can come to appreciate his highly critical and devilishly playful view of the norms governing the representation of gender and ethnic differences and the ebbs and flows of sexual desire. This certainly wasn't clear to me when we first discussed doing this series in the department. For his part, Rembert, who knew better, kept trying to convince me Lubitsch wasn't simply another canonical heterosexual male director to get his own film series. There was something else going on in these depictions of adultery and threesomes and with the ingenious presentation of these self-conscious, socially disruptive female and Jewish characters. I should have known better myself because one of the first Lubitsch films I ever saw was Ich möchte kein Mann sein. And that was during a special screening presented in the early 90s by the San Francisco Queer Film Festival. With Ossie Oswalda's delightfully disruptive gender performance, Ich möchte kein Mann sein is certainly no exception in Lubitsch's oeuvre. Moreover, as the extensive archival research by our guest tonight, Laura Horwack, um, has shown such cross-dressing women are hardly an exception in the silent era. Indeed, Laura's pioneering book, Girls Will Be Boys, Cross-Dressed Women, Lesbians, and American Cinema, published by Rutgers University Press in 2016, and there are postcards um, at the front desk, and I believe here outside, um, uh, advertising the book, and they're also in and of themselves lovely little objects to take home. So Laura's um, pioneering book features an appendix listing a whopping 476 films that feature cross-dressed women between 1904 and 1934. Laura is an assistant professor in film studies with a cross-listing in women's and gender studies at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. In addition to a focus on gender and sexuality in film history, she specializes in silent cinema, film historiography, and also Swedish cinema. She co-edited the 2014 anthology, Silent Cinema and the Politics of Space, together with Jennifer Bean, our guest a couple weeks ago, and with Anna Puma Kapsa. And she's currently working on two projects, as I understand. One is a book for Rutgers University Press that investigates gay, Jewish, Swedish filmmaker Moritz Stiller. And the other, um, as she just informed me, is um, a project that is investigating the history of transgender made or, or 
of transgender films made by transgender people and transsexuals in North America and Canada. Um, and that will also be an extensive project with a public component, namely a website that can be amended by all of us, including you, Urs. Please join me in welcoming Laura Horak. Thanks so Mark, much, Mark, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to Mark and Rembert Hooser and Vincent Heidegger uh, from the university and, the film, the, and also the Film Museum and everyone else who made this evening possible. And thanks also very much to Jerusa, the accompanist. Um, it's watching silent films with live music is I think one of the best things in the world. Um, so we're really excited that we get this chance. Um, I also apologize in advance for my terrible German pronunciation. In this talk, I will use English translations for the German film titles I talk about. Cross-dress women were important to silent cinema all over the world. As Mark mentioned, in the research for my book, Girls Will Be Boys, Cross-Dressed Women, Lesbians, and American Cinema, I found almost 500 American silent films featuring cross-dressed women. Cross-dressed women were also popular in German films and can also be found in the silent films of Britain, France, Italy, Sweden, Denmark, Austria, and Australia, as well as the early sound films of Poland, India, China, and Japan. Some of these cross-dressing films feel very familiar, regardless of where they were made, because they adapt the tr transnational theatrical genre of the gender-disguised comedy. Twelfth Night and Charlie's Ants are two popular examples of this genre. Media scholar Silke Arnold de Simin argues that German cross-dressing comedies like Victor and, and Victoria were transnational even before they were remade in Britain and the United States because they were filmed in different languages and with international casts or in different countries altogether. I suggest that this transnationality can be detected even earlier in the 19-teens because the genre conventions of the cross-dressing film, films made throughout Europe and the United States drew on conventions established by plays written and performed throughout these countries. Furthermore, these cross-dressing films made throughout, US and the US, throughout Europe and the US traveled around and inspired local imitators that then traveled in turn. So it's a mistake to analyze a gender disguise film from a particular country or director as a unique object, rather than as a particular instance of a popular and transnational and transmedial genre. However, other films featuring cross-dressed women, and also some aspects of these disguised comedies too, are more locally specific and draw on particular national and regional performance traditions and are shaped by particular cultural contexts. These contexts include the existence and publicness of sexual subcultures and medical sexology, contests over social hierarchy and gender norms, anxieties about social change, and social movements, like the women's movement, the sexual reform movement, and the dress reform movement. Not just production, but also the reception of traveling films were shaped by these contexts. Tonight, we're going to watch the wonderful 1918 Ernst Lubitsch film, I Don't Want to Be a Man, as part of the Film Museum's Fantastic Lubitsch series. And I'm really sad I couldn't see all of them together with you. This film will be accompanied by the two Asta Nielsen films that are somewhat less frequently screened, Zapata's Gang from 1914 and The ABCs of Love from 1916. Some scholars, film festivals, and fans have taken I Don't Want to Be a Man to be a unique example of joyful female-to-male cross-dressing in silent cinema and of the open expression of queer desire through the gimmick of cross-dressing. 
When a silent cross-dressing film is wanted for an LGBT or a silent film festival screening, I Don't Want to Be a Man is quite often the film chosen, including in San Francisco, too. They just showed it again this last summer. Um, I mean, it's great, but there's a few more that they can choose from, too. Um, it's a delightful, fun, and surprising film, as you'll see tonight. But rather than seeing it as de facto unique, I would like to add... Oh, those are the other films we're seeing tonight. I forgot to show you those pictures. Here we go. Um, I would also like to ask, how does I Don't Want to Be a Man fit into the wider set of films featuring cross-dressed women? How is it similar to and different from other films featuring cross-dressed women, both in Germany and the United States? And in general, how are the cross-dressing women of early German cinema similar to and different from the cross-dressed women of early American cinema? The two films screened alongside I Don't Want to Be a Man tonight will help us think through these questions alongside observations from my research on American cross-dressed women and the other German films featuring cross-dressed women that I've been able to see. German and film queer... German and queer film scholars have investigated cross-dressed women in German silent films and Lubitsch's I Don't Want to Be a Man in particular. Alice Kuzniar reads the film as a spectacular rendition of the third sex popular in medical sexology of the period and an expression of unruly queer de genders and desires, while Valerie Weinstein, who I think spoke here in December, argues that the film uses the gender disguise genre to render pleasurable some of the social changes wrought by modernity, such as the ready-to-wear fashion industry, which made class and gender distinctions harder to maintain, ultimately reaffirming these distinctions in a modified form. Queer film scholar Richard Dyer also reads the film, alongside a number of German silent cross-dressing films, as opportunities for lesbian insinuations. German film archivist Thomas Brandelmeier includes five examples of cross-dressed women in his short survey of early German comedies, ranging from military conformist comedies to Asta Nielsen comic grotesques. And German scholars like Heide Schlutmann, Carola Gram Gramann, Silke Arnold de Simin, and Christine Mielke have also done important work on cross-dressed women in early German cinema, but unfortunately, it's almost all in German, which I can't read, sadly. So I have consulted their English language scholarship where it exists and other scholars' summaries of their work in English. But I really think it would be valuable for uh, the poor kind of Anglophone-only film scholars or Anglophone and Swed Swedish scholars if more of the work could be translated. So um, I wish I could have incorporated that. <laughs> So in this talk, I'll build on this scholarship to consider how German silent films featuring cross-dressed women compare to American films, and how these three films in particular fit into these trends. In American cinema, cross-dressed women appeared the most often between 1908 and 1919, which roughly aligns to uh, what people have called the transitional era. More than 300 films featuring cross-dressed women were released during this period, an average of 26 per year. Around a third of those featured actresses playing boy roles, which I call female boys, like this 1916 adaptation of Oliver Twist that you can see newspaper coverage of here. The other films were frontier and civil war dramas, historical dramas, and gender disguised romantic comedies. And on the right is one example of a frontier film. I argue in my book that American cinema turned to cross-dressed women during the transitional era to help legitimize the industry and appeal to middle-class women. Though it might surprise us today, far from being transgressive or questionable, these performances were understood to embody American ideals of boyhood and girlhood. The female boy films drew on long-standing traditions of Anglo-American theater, including adaptations of popular plays like Oliver Twist, The Prince and the Pauper, and Little Lord Fauntleroy. Middle-class women already regularly patronized plays like these, in which women played boy roles, and also bought novels, children's clothing, and branded merchandise associated with these plays, particularly Little Lord Fauntleroy. Female boy performers 
embodied romantic ideals of boyhood as innocent, beautiful, and wise. The frontier and war films drew on popular American folklore about women disguising themselves as men to make their fortune out west or to fight in the Civil War. These sorts of stories had appeared regularly in newspapers, memoirs, and songs. American moving picture producers drew upon familiar stories of cross-dressing cowboy girls and girl spies in order to appeal simultaneously to working class and genteel audiences, with hopes of establishing the cross-class, trans-regional audiences like the ones attending Wild West shows. As production companies increasingly moved to California, these films also helped to align the moving picture industry with American frontier vitality. Film companies looked to cross-dressed women in order to attract middle-class women and families to the cinema by presenting beloved entertainment traditions with a new cinematic twist. They also offered distinctively American stories and landscapes that European countries could not compete with. Only in the 1920s, when the American film industry began to capitalize on public interest in lesbianism, did cross-dressed women start to fall under suspicion and be publicly associated with sexual deviance. American cinema of the 20s and early 30s usually represented lesbians as an aspect of Europe, particularly Paris or ancient Rome, rather than as something possible within U.S. borders. However, in German films of the teens, cross-dressed women seem to have functioned quite differently. Here are some of the German films of the Wilhelmine era that featured cross-dressed women, and I put the ones we're going to see today in orange. As you can see from the list, cross-dressed women in German films of the teens seem to have been more confined to comedies and more often associated with romance. Unlike American films from this period, there don't seem to be many actresses playing male roles, although there were a few in the Weimar period. There don't seem to be many characters who disguise their gender to carry out heroic deeds, as in the American frontier and war films, with the exception of the mystery of Richmond Castle, in which a female detective impersonates a man who is the target of a dangerous gang in order to keep him safe. American and German films alike use the military, and allegedly all-male space, as an opportunity for female-to-male cross-dressing. But whereas the American war films that featured cross-dressed women, women were dramas and thrillers set in the past and had cross-dressed women protagonists who carried out heroic deeds, the German military films were comedies, were mostly set in the present or recent past, and had cross-dressed women protagonists who sneak in to be close to their sweethearts. Or else a male cadet dreams of bossing women recruits around, as in, it would have been so nice. A handful of this type of military romantic comedies were also made in the U.S., but they were much less common than heroic depictions of cross-dressed women soldiers. In Germany, these cross-dressing military comedies disappeared during and after the First World War, perhaps not surprisingly, since the actual experience of war was not very comedic, and only reappeared in the early 30s with the Dolly Haas film Love's Commando. One major difference between the social context in which these films were made was that cross-dressed women were already under suspicion of deviance in Germany, but not in the United States. Sexual subcultures and medical sexological writings about deviant genders and sexualities were much more visible to the German public than they were to the American public. European sexologists had been describing people with unusual gender expressions and sexual desires as sexual inverts, homosexuals, and uranians, or earnings, since the mid-19th century, and many of the pioneering scientists and activists were based in Germany. Already in the 1890s, activist scientist Magnus Hirschfeld helped launch the German sexual reform movement, and the 1907 Eulenburg Affair, a libel trial about alleged homosexual encounters between General Kuno von Moltke and Prince Philip von Eulenburg, brought male homosexuality to public attention. As Valerie Weinstein has described, women who wore masculine styles were also under some suspicion in the teens. 
the adoption of pants into women's fashion, in tandem with women's entrance into sports, the workplace, and universities, and the choice by some lesbians to wear a style of dress based on the men's suit, led many commentators to complain that the, the distinctions between the sexes were dissolving. Already in 1911, journalist Eugene Isolani published a whole book devoted to the woman in pants, Die Frau in der Hose, that that's the extent of my German, thanks, that charted the controversies around this style, which included, quote, mockery, public demonstrations, and rules banning women in pants from public places, end quote. Isolani described an 1890 divorce case in which a Berlin man divorced his wife because he believed that her predilection for wearing pants to masquerade balls showed homosexual leanings. It's dangerous. Well, some sexologists in the U.S. also worried that women who wore men's clothes should be suspected of broader pathology, and some commentators also complained about women's incursion into male domains, the tendency to connect masculine styles and deviant sexual identities uh, was limited in the U.S. to the elite. In popular culture, women in men's clothing were much more often heralded as athletic modern women. Many stores advertised attractive mannish clothing for men. I mean, for women. <laughs> for men, too, probably. But. Although there were laws in many cities against wearing, quote, a dress not belonging to his or her sex, end quote, when journalists interviewed people living as men who had been assigned female at birth, the stories often reported favorably about these individuals, even when they had married women. The publicly expressed concerns about Uranians, inverts, and lesbians in Germany in the teens only started to reach the U.S. public in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Thus, it makes sense that cross-dressed women in German films were more confined to comedies, a genre well-suited for raising taboo subjects under the veil of ridicule. As Weinstein argues, Lubitsch's comedy of mistaken identity allows for safe play with the social challenges perceived to be posed by modernization, and its happy ending of unveiled identities, clarified social positions, and heterosexual love matches restores stability and difference. The same argument could be made for these Wilhelmine cross-dressing comedies more generally. German films also place cross-dressed women more often in heterosexual relationships than American films did. However, as queer film scholar Chris Strayer has pointed out, combining romance with a cross-dressed character almost always leads to accidental same-sex desire. In these cases, through the woman who's the, the women who desire the cross-dressed women and may hug and kiss her, and the men desired by the cross-dressed women and who sometimes might de desire them back, even when they believe the character to be a boy. Although confining cross-dressing to romantic comedies is conservative in one way, it also created space for play with sexual desire, creating the anarchistic queer riot of desire that Kuzniar observes and that Strayer argues is a crucial appeal of of the long-lived gender disguise comedy. Cross-dressed women continue to appear regularly in Weimar cinema. As you can see, most of the films were still romantic comedies, but they were joined by some dramas and adaptations from opera and theater, as well as Enlightenment film. While U.S. films were sometimes inspired by stories of individuals assigned a female at birth who lived as men, the films only ever portrayed gender cross-dressing as a temporary practical necessity, not an expression of identity. Several Weimar films, however, explicitly presented individuals who identified as a sex other than simply the one assigned them at birth, or who used clothing to signify their deviant sexual orientation. The famous Enlightenment film, different from the others, argued for the rights of inverts and homosexuals, and featured women in tuxedos dancing with women in dresses in a gay bar that the protagonist visits several times. That same year, another Enlightenment film, called Memoirs of a Man's Maiden Years, adapted the 1907 autobiography of an intersex individual who was raised female and transitioned to male. 
The film is unfortunately presumed lost, and I'm not sure how it presented the story or whether the actor who played the protagonist was male or female. Regardless, the film testified to the existence of actual people who permanently cross lines of gender, not only temporary fictional crossings. Two historical films, Petticoat Excellency and Marquis d'Eon, presented versions of the story of the Chevalier d'Eon, an 18th century French spy who lived for many years as a man and for many years as a woman, and whose sex even post-mortem examinations failed to determine, though both of these films presented Dayon more simply as a woman disguised as a man. Germany, like the United States and England, had a long theatrical tradition of women playing male roles and female characters disguising their gender. In Germany, the tradition went by the name of Hosenrolle, or breeches rolls. One important part of this tradition was opera, which had a stronger tradition in Germany than in the United States, and which regularly featured female performers with their higher vocal range playing young men. Weimar films occasionally included women in male roles in theatrical adaptations. In The Marriage of Figaro, a woman played the page Cherubino, just as she would on the opera stage, even though in silent film the question of vocal range was moot. Most famously, Asta Nielsen played Hamlet in her 1921 adaptation, though she presented Hamlet as a girl disguised as a boy, rather than play him as a boy, as other famous actresses like Sarah Bernhardt had done. Unlike Nielsen's previous cross-dressing roles, her performance as Hamlet was dramatic rather than comedic. It was her most ambitious and most lauded cross-dressing performance, and also her last. In contrast, American films never featured women in the serious dramatic male roles that they had previously played on stage. Interestingly, girls in uniform, in Girls in Uniform, the protagonist Manuela is emboldened by her Hosenrolle performance to declare her feelings for her teacher to her entire class. The film represents Hosenrolle as a kind of gateway to lesbianism. Overall, the representation of cross-dressed women in German film displayed greater awareness of real-life gender and sexual diversity than American films, although this meant that the films tended to be more conventional and more often confined to the comic register. Although German films often portrayed cross-dressed women as high-energy, stylish, modern girls, they did not seem to associate these figures with nationalist mythology and gender ideals, unlike America's cross-dressing frontier girls. Now that we have a better sense of the wider ecology of cross-dressed women films, we can start to think about how Lubitsch's 1918 comedy, I Don't Want to Be a Man, fits in. In this film, comedian Ossie Osvalda plays an upper-class girl named Ossie who disguises herself as a man in order to go out dancing, despite the contrary orders of her guardian, Dr. Kersten, played by Kurt Goetz. At the dance hall, she eventually encounters Kirsten, and they spend the evening getting drunk and toasting their brotherhood. And I apologize for spoilers, but it won't ruin the movie, I promise. By the evening's end, it'll even make it more exciting, I think, they kiss, they kiss sloppily and take a carriage together, continuing to kiss. In their drunken stupor, they are delivered to the wrong apartments and wake up in the wrong beds. Once Ossie returns to her own room, Kirsten spies her long hair, and they run together into an enthusiastic embrace. <clears throat> In many ways, I Don't Want to Be a Man is typical of the transnational gender-disguised comedy genre. Indeed, one contemporary German reviewer of the film remarked that, quote, The story of the mad, high-spirited young girl who, as a boy, encounters all sorts of hardship and finally lands in the port of marriage has been brought to the stage a thousand times before in all possible variations, end quote. Indeed, the film fits the conventions of the gender disguise comedy that queer scholar Chris Strayer has enumerated. There is narrative motivation for the disguise. The disguise is convincing to people in the film, but not to the film's audience. There are gags based on the character's inability to pull off things required of the enacted gender. The character becomes sensitized to the trials of being another gender. 
The disguise creates opportunities for accidental same-sex desire. There's a big reveal, and the film ends with the formation of a heterosexual couple. Furthermore, as feminist film scholar Annette Kuhn has observed of American cross-dressing comedies, much of the humor comes from the disjunction between the film audience's superior knowledge and that of the characters who are duped. Also, the film only suggests the fantasy of, of, mobi of gender mobility, but ultimately affirms the body as the authoritative site of the character's real sex. In all these aspects, the film is very similar to other gender disguise comedies, including many of the ones being made at the time. Asi is one of several girls who disguise their gender in order to go out on the town at night, including the protagonist of the 1916 American comedy Peggy and the 1926 Swedish comedy The Girl in Tales. Like Asta Nielsen in Youth and Madness, and the protagonist of the American films Making a Man of Her, Her Father's Son, and The Danger Girl, Aussie must undergo several tests of manhood, including drinking, smoking, and flirting with women. Although her American counterparts um, are also usually challenged to a fight, as you can see here, which probably says something about American versus German masculinity, unfortunately, for America. Aussie's confusion about which bathroom to enter also gets repeated in later, the later American film, Sylvia Scarlet. To me, the most interesting aspect of I Don't Want to Be a Man is the fact that Kirsten clearly falls for his boy companion long before he realizes that this boy is secretly a girl. And yet this plot point also appears in the American films Arrange Romance, 1911, Making a Man of Her, 1912, and Little Old New York, 1923, as well as in the later, delightfully perverse German film, The Violinist of Florence, 1926. In fact, films often use cross-dressed women to depict passionate relationships between two apparent men. In my book, I show that in American films, cross-dressed white women were particularly important for frontier stories because these women allowed the men to fall in love with a male companion but end up with a proper white middle-class wife, thus solving one of the ideological conundrums of this male-dominated space. However, the thing that makes I Don't Want to Be a Man completely unique, at least as far as I can tell, are these repeated sloppy kisses between Kirsten and the disguised Aussie, and the fact that they're often presented in extended close-ups. Even though we know, and Aussie knows, that these kisses are heterosexual, Kirsten doesn't know that, and yet he repeatedly kisses his young male companion, both in the dance hall and in the carriage. I don't see how Kirsten's desire could be read as anything other than same-sex desire, which makes this one of the most queer of the cross-dressing comedies. The German public's knowledge of same-sex desire, spread by sexology, the sexual reform movement, and the controversies over the Eulenburg affair, mean that audiences could easily have read Kirsten as potentially homosexual or inverted. His interest in the female Aussie at the film's end comes as something of a surprise. You do see some similar displays of affection, but between women, in the 1914 American film A Florida Enchantment. The protagonist Lillian swallows a seed that magically changes her sex, but she looks the same on the outside. Almost immediately, two women begin aggressively flirting with Lillian. Although we know Lillian's sex has secretly changed, these women can't know that. Although these women do hug Lillian and invite her to kiss them on the lips, we still don't get anything like the sloppy kisses of I don't want to be a man. In fact, throughout the Lubitsch film, the camera offers a series of close-ups of sensuous, almost grotesque faces, as when a gang of passing uh, men open their mouths for Aussie to throw candy into them. Yeah, it's an amazing scene, which you will see shortly. And when a drunken Aussie takes a drag of a cigar and becomes nauseated. The close-up kisses between two apparent men are the final and most intense of this escalating series of close-ups. The film apparently had censorship troubles. According to the reviews, the film was initially released in October 1918 with significant cuts, and the complete film wasn't released until 1921. 
Although I haven't seen the censorship documents, I would guess that these kisses were the first to go. This is another important difference between cross-dressed women in U.S. versus German films. In the U.S., censors hailed films with cross-dressed women as the wholesome answer to worrisome slapstick comedies, and the films never had any censorship trouble until the early 30s. Scholars have tended to read I Don't Want to Be a Man without considering its place within the larger genre of the gender disguise comedy, or the context of German films featuring cross-dressed women. If we consider how it fits within these contexts, we can see that many elements are consistent with the genre, such as the disparity in audience and character knowledge, the tests of manhood, and the representation of accidental same-sex desire. However, comparing it to other films reveals that the close-ups on the sloppy kisses between Kirsten and the disguised Aussie are completely unique, and I think one of the main reasons this film has been such a perennial favorite. Asta Nielsen's 1914 film, The ABCs of Love, could almost be considered a parody of the genre conventions that I Don't Want to Be a Man upholds. In this film, Nielsen plays Liz, a wealthy young woman who finds that her betrothed, Philip, played by Ludwig Trautmann, doesn't live up to her fantasy of a male suitor. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't flirt, and his clothes are downright dowdy. She tricks him into going to Paris with her and then dons men's clothes in order to teach him how to be a real man and to romance a woman in the proper way. When her father tracks him down in Paris, she decides to keep up the charade. But her father soon sees through her, and he and Philip put one over on Liz. In the end, the couple marries, and Philip becomes the kind of man that Liz had been dreaming about. Asta Nielsen was one of the most popular and praised stars of the silent era. Her popularity helped launch the monopoly system of booking, as Martin Leuperdinger and others have shown. Heidi Schlittmann has shown that starting in 1911, Nielsen had more control over her productions than any other actor, and that she put women's fears, desires, and fantasies onto the screen, engaging audiences in mutual play. Artistically ambitious, Nielsen played almost every kind of role imaginable in every genre. Four of her films centered on cross-dressing, so Youth and Madness, Zapata's Gang, The ABCs of Love, and Hamlet. Her characters also temporarily don masculine garb in The Girl Without a Homeland, The Suffragette, and The Queen of the Stock Market, and she appeared in a Pierrot outfit in the film Prima Donna and Comedians. In addition to crossing gender, she played across lines of age as an Angeline and race as an Eskimo baby. In Zapata's gang, she crosses lines of gender and race and profession. In some ways, the ABCs of love is similar to I Don't Want to Be a Man. The protagonist is a wealthy young girl who dons men's formal wear and attends a dance and flirts with other women. The film's viewer is always positioned to have the maximum amount of knowledge. However, the film makes a very different point about masculinity. Whereas Aussie finds the tests of manhood onerous, and she's not very good at them, the joke in the earlier film is that Liz makes a much better man than Philip does. She smokes and drinks with a plum, pushes Philip aside at the ticket counter, and effortlessly play acts the kind of seduction her ideal man would employ. She's also a hit with the women at the opera house. Only by following her lead does Philip come stumbling into manhood. However, the film's approach to same-sex attraction is much more toned down. When one of the women at the opera house ki hugs and kisses the disguised Liz, she makes faces at the camera to demonstrate how uninterested she is in the woman's affection. Philip is never fooled by Liz's disguise, so we never interpret his interest in her as homoerotic. Finally, in the last part of the film, the cross-dressed Liz becomes the butt of the joke. She's easily tricked by Philip and her father's charade, can't tell that the woman they're dining with is actually a man in disguise, and is the one who must learn her lesson. Thus, the structure of knowledge is quite different from the typical cross-dressing comedy in which the cross-dresser is in on the joke. In line with Schlupmann's argument that Nielsen's films explore women's fantasies through play, 
The ABCs of Love depicts a young woman who fantasizes about the kind of man and romantic relationship she wants, and then uses exuberant role plays to teach a man how to fulfill those desires. While cross-dressed women are often more popular with other women than men are in these types of films, it's pretty unusual for the cross-dressed woman to be better at manhood in virtually every way. However, the film's ending with this gender-normative heterosexual couple is typical of the genre. Nielsen's next cross-dressing film, Zapata's Gang, is one of the more unusual ones that I've seen, so it's exciting to be able to see it tonight on the big screen. The film operates outside many of the conventions of the gender-disguised comedy. In this film, Nielsen plays a Danish film star who travels to Italy with a film troupe to make a movie about a gang of bandits. And the film company that the character works for, Nordland, is suspiciously similar to Nordisk, where Nielsen had begun her career, and which had shot several sensational action films on location in Italy. Nielsen and her troupe are so convincing as bandits that they accidentally hold up a real countess and her daughter, Elena. <laughs> you can see that in this scene. Nielsen is extremely dashing in her bandit outfit and handy with the pistols she keeps slung in her belt. Elena falls in love with the gang's handsome leader. At the same time, a group of real bandits steal the film troupe's ordinary clothes and escape under the noses of the police. The film troupe is stuck in their bandit outfits, shot at by the local townspeople, and unable to explain themselves because they can't speak Italian. <laughs> While trying to find food, Nielsen enters Elena's bedroom through the window at night, and the girl demonstrates her ardent affection for the handsome bandit. After more adventures, the troupe is rescued in the nick of time by the Scandinavian consul. Like other gender disguised comedies, the film's viewer has the maximum amount of knowledge throughout the film, and the cross-dressed woman proves extremely popular with other women. However, in most other ways the film is completely different. Nielsen's character has no male suitor, and the film does not conclude with the formation of a couple. Nielsen's motivation for the disguise is professional, a film shoot, but the, that, the fact that she plays across gender is not made into a big deal. Many films of this period depicted film shoots mistaken for reality, but it was unusual for these types of films to also feature cross-dressed characters. Nielsen's character slips into the role effort effortlessly and does not seem to find manhood onerous or to forget to act manly, though she does get tired of the criminal lifestyle. Thus, Nielsen's performance of manhood is not really played for laughs. Furthermore, the spectacle of cross-dressing is intermixed with the spectacular landscapes and ancient villages of northern Italy, generating a certain tension between the theatricality of the costumes and the realism of the setting. Like in the ABCs of love, Nielsen makes faces when the other woman hugs and kisses her, trying to convince the film audience that she is not enjoying all this female attention. On the one hand, these grimaces try to establish Nielsen's character as absolutely heterosexual. On the other hand, having to actively demonstrate disgust means that audiences were well aware that some women would welcome this type of affection. Interestingly, when the American Production Code Administration assessed the scene in the 1934 gender disguised comedy Sylvia Scarlet, in which a maid embraces and kisses a disguised Catherine Hepburn, they cut the part where Cat Hepburn reacts with disgust, explaining that this disgust could be read as a reaction to potential lesbianism. Joseph Breen wrote to the producer that, quote, There should be nothing suggestively emphasized by any horrified reaction on the part of Sylvia, end quote. Thus, objecting too much, as Nielsen does in both films, may have raised the specter of lesbianism, even as it was intended to dispel it. While it is a comedy that features gender disguise, Zapata's gang foregoes much of the conventions of the gender disguise comedy. The film is unique to its particular time and its particular star. It's the sort of film that would not get remade again and again, like the more conventional iterations of the genre. 
It shows off Nielsen's acting range and celebrates the misadventures of shooting films in foreign countries. Like many of Nielsen's other films, it extols play, even as the story presents a cautionary tale of play overtaking reality. It offers an interesting counterpoint to Lubitsch's more typical gender-disguised comedy and Nielsen's previous parody of this genre. Despite the long life and consistency of the gender-disguised comedy genre, cross-dressed women have been used many different ways and meant many different things over the course of cinema history. Overall, the cross-dressed women of German films look more like the cross-dressed women we are familiar with today than early American films do, because they were already acknowledging female masculinity as a sign of gender and sexual deviance, and because they mostly adhered to the long-standing conventions of the gender disguise comedy. However, it can be refreshing to remember just how queer early filmmakers were willing to be, as in those kisses between Kirsten and Ossie, and to remember the very different ways cross-dressing could be configured, from the ABCs of love to Zapata's gang. Filmmakers of the silent era looked to cross-dressed women because they were believed to appeal to everyone, young and old, men and women, gays and straights, and everyone in between. This appeal, however reconfigured, continues to this day. I hope you enjoy the films. Thanks very much. Jerusa Miller. Um, uh, let's welcome Laura Horak back for a discussion. Oh, um, yeah, I, I just have one microphone up here, but I think there will be others coming. So if there are questions from the audience. Also, um, Jerusa is here also if there are questions for her. Um, maybe I'll start with um, first a comment, Laura, just maybe I'll come back to, to Lubitsch. And um, one thing um, that struck me right from the beginning um, is that the, the, um, the situation where, sorry, I'm a little sleepy right now. Um, the situation where, um, where um, Ossie Oswalda then will cross-dress. Um, it, it seems that from the beginning, there's there's uh, something there's something um, in her, her kind of um, disruptive behavior that unleashes the desires of others. Mm -hmm. That there's an atmosphere in which um, um, not behaving according to uh, a gender norm um, makes it somehow possible that other people find desires in themselves. So that oh, thank you so much. So that the um, so that the you know her governant um, does finds out that she really likes to smoke, and the um, uncle, you know, I mean, well, he probably had a few drinks every night anyway. But nevertheless, he like then drinks, um, and then that that sort of creates a kind of cycle in which the gender, um, um, the cross dressing fits in. It's a kind of a, a kind of circle of desire that that actually one sees often in Lubitsch. Um, whether or not there's cross-dressing. But, but is this something that you see in other um, cross-dressing films? I and mean, we saw, I don't know if we can talk about that in the same way, but just the, how cross-dressing um, then allows other people to experience desires mm -hmm. that maybe they wouldn't uh, um, um, express in public or... or mm -hmm. Is this on? Oh, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, that's a great question and observation I um, I mean one thing that struck me also mm. seeing the film again is how much it's initially about hypocrisy about mm. adults telling kids what they can't do and then mm -hmm. doing it themselves um, which is a common complaint of adolescence mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and so um, so I do think you know her I, I think she accurately sees that who can do what they want to do the most often it's sort mm -hmm. of like 
young white men or sort of slightly more grown up men. And then of course the film kind of teaches her that like, oh, being a man is hard because, mm -hmm. you know, you have to stand up or you have to like, but you know, kind of find your place amongst um, this sort of, you know, men's bodies. Um, and I think, but I do think uh, very often in the films that are um, like gender disguised comedies like mm -hmm. this, it is a young woman who mm -hmm. is kind of feeling constrained by, by her desires and what the rules are and that she doesn't want to follow them. Um, and so that's what leads her into dressing up like a man. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, um, I was thinking about how, you know, she does, like, even the way all those men, like, open their mouths under her window, there is this kind of unleashing uh, or, like, that, she, yeah, she she is this catalyst for, um, for, for people to sort of enact what they really want or what, mm -hmm. and... And I think certainly you always, or you almost always have um, something about how the crossdress woman allows adult men to um, behave towards other men in ways they couldn't otherwise. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Although I think also maybe the figure of the boy does that, even when it's not a crossdress woman too. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, that you can have a kind of um, friendship or sort of like ways of being together that mm -hmm. would ordinarily be um, kind of not appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Maybe, thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll ask just one other question. Maybe a question to Jerusa, since um, you're standing here so beautifully with us. Um, do do you um, do you find um, you you um, perform in drag on a stage or in in a performance context? Um, do you find also maybe it's a silly question, but do you find also that your um, for these moments you're performing in drag? enables other people to express desires that that they wouldn't otherwise express is that something you play with do you try to is it do you do you perform do you try to bring out desires in other people i wouldn't say that i play with it that's something that happens mm -hmm. because uh, when i dress like a woman uh, i'm uh, the same person mm -hmm still the same person. So um, it's just one side of me that comes, that I show mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. with the, the clothes. And uh, I think that this is something that naturally happens. So with persons that normally wouldn't have a desire for a man, but mm -hmm. a man dressed like a woman. No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see, so, so of course then it does unleash other kinds of desires in other people. Yeah. Well, I know some uh, drag queens and uh, people that uh, cross dress, and um, each person is different. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when there are people that they really want, they for them is necessary to play with this this character and seduce other people and try to seduce also people that they will never seduce as a man. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's, it's, it's always different. Yeah, yeah. No. And maybe I'll just, sorry, just ask one more question for Jerusa, um, and then um, open it up for questions. Um, um, do, um, I know you'll be performing here, you'll be accompanying a film on July 8th, um, or yes. Jefferson. Yes, Miller. but in, in boy drag. In boy drag, <laughs> exactly. So in boy drag. Yeah. And, do you um do you perform differently when you're accompanying a film when you Yes, absolutely. Because it's more you react to the moment. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. You have of course a repertoire of uh, ideas and uh, inspirations mm -hmm. and sometimes I also play um uh, pieces from other composers, but very rarely that was for me just because it's a, a composer of Brazil. Mm -hmm. that he played in the 10s and the 20s uh, on uh, silent movies in Rio de Janeiro. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and I love him so much and his music so much that was for me important in this scene of um, uh, Ich möchte kein Mann sein. Ich möchte kein Mann sein. Richtig? Ich auch nicht. Das... Uh, 
äh, wo, in diesem Ballszene. Mhm. Das, das habe ich so als Idee gehabt. Aber klar, es ist sehr unterschiedlich. Äh, jetzt spreche ich auf Deutsch. It's, it's very, okay, it's yeah. very different than uh, playing in a normal concert or in another kind of event, for example. I also do piano drag. Uh, when mm -hmm. I, I, it's not piano bar, but piano mm -hmm. drag. <laughs> when I play in bars, mm -hmm. uh, in drag. Uh, and um, I have also my own show singing and, and playing. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like to play mm -hmm. and sing. And I guess, I guess um, what I also just finally wondered is when you play here as Jerusa, um, do you perform differently than when you perform as Jefferson Miller? Yes, yes. I think that... And that's the thing about doing drag that allows you to be different. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say be another person because how I, how I said, I'm still the same person. Mm -hmm. And it's for me important to be mm -hmm. the same person. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, I have more freedom in some aspects. Mm -hmm. Because me as Jefferson, I, was, I had an... Um, Uh, I studied music mm -hmm. and the classical music. So classical mu music is really tighten up. Mm -hmm. And this has, allows me to break a little bit these rules and yeah, have more freedom with the music mm -hmm. for me as a musician. Something that probably I wouldn't do if I am in boy drag. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And the composer, um, the Brazilian composer? Oh, the name? Yes. Uh, Ernesto Nazare. Nazare. Nazareth. Yeah. Oh, like okay. Nazareth, the, the city. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. Um, are there comments or questions from all of you? We've now seen three films. And yes, there's a comment here. I'll, I'll bring you a microphone. Thanks for your talk. Um, just to break the ice <laughs> for discussion and for the sake of the argument. Um, you said something uh, during your talk that you were not so happy that Ich möchte kein Mann sein is shown all the time at queer festivals. Maybe you're right. <laughs> If I have two reasons for that, why I would agree with that. Um, number one, I think it's a very conservative film. Um, there are many historical reasons or psychological reasons one can give. Uh, I just want to focus on two issues, and you already hinted at it when talking with Mark. Um, she is the little girl, but also she doesn't have any parents. Rather, it's only the uncle, okay? And the uncle doesn't really desire her as a woman. Whereas there are hints in the movie, <laughs> on two occasions, where it's clear that Kerstin desires her as a woman, okay? So... That, that is interesting uh, in terms of power relations and so on. So it's it's not so much about not so much about gender maybe. And the number two reason is uh, you were referring to the kiss as slobby. <laughs> okay. Now um, I would agree with that in a sense, but they're also brotherly. They're not really sexually. I, I can I couldn't see that really. These are regular conventional styles of brotherly kisses, kisses or people when they're drunk. I'm sorry, just I'm finished in a second, yeah? So, so I'm just saying, for me, they were not so sexual, but maybe it's a matter of taste or of what you've been experiencing in your life. But, <laughs> but uh, could you comment on these two issues? And maybe this is a really rather conservative or rather uh, film and more about power relations than about gender. Sure, thanks for that comment. Um, uh, so scholars have been debating back and forth whether the film is conservative in the end, or more liberatory and queer in the end. And they tend to do that with cross-dressing films uh, in general, I think because these comedies have these generic tendencies to kind of have these middles where everything is thrown up in the air and like things are undone and different possibilities become possible, but then they almost always like wrap it up very tightly um, by kind of undoing that, reasserting the kind of natural order of male and female and class orders and things. So the question of how you read it often depends on whether you kind of put more weight in the end or in the, the middle. Um, so, and I think as a mass medium, film is always trying to have it always with all audiences if it can. So it's, you know, conservative at the same time as it's transgressive. Um, and every audience member is going to make the reading that 
they want. Um, and that makes it a film that people go see and that you can bring a variety of people to. And they'll all be like, oh, that was great, but for really different reasons. So I think this film is like that. Um, and I think, uh, oh, right. And also there is uh, something that is typical of gender comedies in general, as well as cross-dressing comedies, is this, there's almost a kind of, at the beginning, and maybe toward a, a taming of the shrew sort of element, where, like, here's a girl who's, like, wild, because no one has put her in her place, and there's no authority figure. That's a really common sort of setup, and that um, in the end, in a way, and Kirsten is brought in because he can sort of train her to like you know, curtsy, to listen, to do what she's told. And then at the end, she kind of flips it and, um, you know, she tells him, like, you're going to listen to me. And um, so there's a sense that in some ways she's been brought into line, but in other ways she's continuing this kind of inversion. Um, whereas uh, the ABCs of love, it's clear, like, you know, she is too willful, and then the man finally asserts himself, but of course, that's what she wanted in the first place, that's what she has been trying to get at, so even though he's sort of taking charge, you have the sense that he's doing it according to her plan, um, and as far as the kisses, I think um, I'm actually happy to find someone who finds them brotherly because I've never found them that. And I'm like, how could anyone ever think that? So I'm happy to, um, to know that that reading also continues to exist. Because I do think um, people at the time, some people must have read them that way. Um, well, there, yeah, there were originally, but then in 21, it, it uh, was released in its complete version. I, I mean, um, I thought, because Kerstin is the name of the guy who's, the, yeah. the guy who's brought in, but, but what seemed interesting there is, because, I mean, his, that whole first scene when he comes in, I think he, he's obviously into her as a woman, yeah. um, but as, a, like, a masochistic woman. Yeah. Like, it's it's quite clearly like he's getting off on on this like disciplinary dominating. thing yeah. and this whole play with i'm going to make you klein yeah. um and then or klein you know um, klein machen and this um and that then that gets switched at the end so so it seems to me somewhat in that sense quite subversive actually that that even though it's um a, a kind of construction of a heterosexual couple at the end it's it's a perverse, if you will, sadomasochistic couple. It's so that there's a kind of perversity that still, mm -hmm. I mean, it's Lubitsch, the guy. Mm -hmm. is, no, but, it, but mm -hmm. that, that seems to me, um, yeah, that's, that's why, in, for me at least, I didn't find it, um, um, I didn't find the, the, the restoration of, of kind of gender normality, let's say, to be a problem because it seemed that that wasn't even potentially the the main issue that that was a way to kind of negotiate these power relations and I will say that um, it's really common in these cross-dressing films like in the American films too for there to be a kind of very um, sort of obviously role-played kind of dominance submission dynamic mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite films is called The Snowbird from 1916, and it's about um, a girl who disguised herself as a boy in order to get um, her father's deed to land that this nasty French-Canadian trapper has stolen, and he hates all women. You know, So she disguised herself as a boy, and he adopts her like as his boy and makes the boy shine his shoes and like get water and... Um, like really obviously kind of his like his boy and then um he he discovers uh i'm trying he he starts whipping her um just still disguises the boy and her hair like falls out of the wig and he's like oh you're a woman and then he um he dresses her in his mother's wedding dress you know <laughs> i guess uh and then he uh, but then he realizes she's already stolen the will or the, the deed and then he's he's going to he sort of threatens to rape her and she threatens to kill herself and then he realizes she's a good woman so then he prostrates himself and hands her the whip and then the next day they like get married and you're like wow they really just don't cover up I mean it really is just like an oscillating uh, like BDSM kind of thing in this wood in the cabin in the woods 
And then they go back to the city and then they say, oh, this is terrible. Let's go back to the woods where we can be ourselves. And they do. And they live happily ever after. Uh, <laughs> But um, but I think there's a way in which, because gender roles are being made uh, performative, also just in general, kind of power differentials, eroticized power differentials, are also made um, performative. Thanks so much again for your talk. Um, this is kind of a general question. Um, just, I guess, I'm interested in what the secondary literature has to say about this. But what I saw, for example, in the second film of the example of cross-dressing seemed a bit different than the first one. And maybe this is just a subjective um, look on the cross-dressing situation, but for me it was the boot that kept, or that never stayed up, the boot that was constantly slouched. And so you had what was coded for me as a very like female body part, always in the foreground. It was there when she was lying down in the bed, she stretched it out when the other woman left the room, and it almost seemed to be as if the characters in that film weren't noticing that leg, but that for us it was a sign that she was very much still a woman. So are there different registers of cross-dressing, or how, how does the secondary literature talk about that? Sure. I mean, there's definitely a range of different masculine styles that women wear when they cross-dress in films at the time. And um, films that tended to be more historical often had clothing that was very feminine, although it was the clothing that men would wear at the time. So there'd be like, you know, ruffles and like tight pants and... Um, and, and historically, on stage, cross-dressing was a way to show off women's bodies. Like when women were wearing corsets, women on stage were not wearing corsets who were playing men. So there is a connection between cross-dressed men and showing off women's bodies in ways that you couldn't otherwise do or that would be seen as immoral. Um, so I think, but with the specific, with the Zapata's gang, um, it's, you know, it's a very stylized kind of like romantic bandit outfit um, that does show off her one leg. Um, so I do think it is, it's intended to be kind of androgynous, um, a bit like the Hamlet character too, that is sort of in between. Um, so I, th and, and it probably is a kind of a fashion statement as well as like, a, you know, a role that she's playing. Um, I think she's meant to be kind of dashing and attractive like to everyone in this in this outfit, um, if not, and not necessarily like oh, t totally convincing as a man, um, yeah. I would be interested in um, how these uh, cross-dressing films translate into mu movie culture and, uh, in particular, into fan culture. And um, I'm wondering, um, because both uh, all the films that we have seen are also star vehicles. So, so you have uh, you have certain um, uh, star personas. You have Osias Walder, You have uh, Asta Nielsen, and you can can go with various options. And um, but if I if I think of um, of the, the of paratexts of these films, so um, then you have, for instance, these collector's cards or this uh, autograph cards. Is there cross-dressing also the usual option that you get there? Because if you think of uh, Asta Nielsen at, um, in, in Love ABC, you have first, you have the glamour shot in the beginning when she's standing there with the roses, so which, which is a, uh, it's, it's a traditional in a way. Uh, it could be a, a star postcard. But then, um, uh, then, sh then she plays with various gender roles. So, is this also something that you can that you can get the male Asta Nielsen as an autograph card, and uh, the male Ossi Oswalda, or other certain? So, are there also differences between stars that allow this, and others that don't, and so? Yeah, great question. And I only really know the answer in the U.S. context. Um, so, s definitely in the U.S. Uh, there were cards, uh, postcards with stars in male dress. Um, and interestingly, not only the stars that were playing male roles in movies, but it was just one of a variety of sort of poses uh, or styles that, um, that actresses um, made promotional postcards of, even if they weren't actually appearing in a film in that particular outfit. So you do find that. Um, definitely during the teens, <coughs> there, uh, it seems like 
almost every actress is playing cross-dressing roles here and there. Um, during the 20s, it starts to be certain actresses who play it over and over and not every actress, so more about their uh, particular star persona. And I think part of, and that's also when the outfits become sort of closer fitting and more sexualized, um, more obviously female. Um, during the teens, when they're sort of only beginning the star system, I think part of the reason why the cross-dressing of that period dies out, which was a more convincing style, um, is that it made it hard to recognize the, the actors. And so um, once they got really uh, <coughs> invested in like, you know, actor and eventually star recognizability, the type of cross-dressing changed and they, you start to have the very feminine makeup with the, you know, men's clothing, whereas previously you didn't have that. Um, so in the 20s, the people who were cross-dressing all the time in the U.S. are like Marion Davies had four or five, um, Leatris Joy, um, uh, what's her name? Um, Anna Q. Nelson had a bunch. Um, Ruth Rowland. So there was certain stars. Sometimes they were like from the West. They were like frontier girls. They were often doing it. But also like Marion Davies was a, you know, a comedian and, and dramatic actress um, who would often play uh, disguise roles in historical pictures. Um, so, uh, and then, and then you get only towards the end of the 20s and the beginning of the 30s do you get stars who actually wear men's clothing in everyday life to like film premieres, to, to publicity um, kind of events like Dietrich and Garbo. Previously, the stars, they would wear them in their pr publicity <coughs> shots and in films, but they wouldn't be going to a premiere wearing men's clothing. That's what starts to happen in the 30s, and that's when commentators also start to wonder, like, huh, is there a reason why these people are also wearing these clothing in their, in their personal life, you know, in their everyday life? Um, and so it, it real that's also when you started to get in the U.S. in 33 production companies um, banned their female stars from wearing men's clothing in public. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how it played out in Germany. Um, yeah. Yeah, here. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a stupid question, but I just uh, wonder um, why do you think it's so complicated today? Because um, uh, to me, it seems everybody under 20 is kind of gender confused. And in these movies, um, I just think there's a kind of lightness of being and just um, cross dress or just put on the cloth you want and just put on the role you want to. And nowadays I have the feelings just everybody, everything has to be really discussed and you have to be in a, uh, everything has to be defined. You, either you're a man, woman, transgender or whatever. And um, I just thought maybe uh, in the year 2017, we should be so free to really say, okay, it, doesn't matter and to have this lightness of being again so why do you think it's so complicated today what I don't know so well I think that I think in the teens and 20s or let's say 1900 to around 1930s um, there was massive shifts about around how gender and sexuality were organized and how people identified themselves and how they what different styles meant, and um, and and films like these films helped uh, kind of deal with that, helped like address that confusion, and also I think inadvertently um, help shape the way in which gender and sexuality would be understood, the kinds, the way in which a you know a woman would be understood, the fact that there were sort of sexual subcultures that could be identified by particular ways of dressing. All of that uh, film participated in in um, in shaping, and I think these last few decades, from say from the '90s onwards, um, you have another kind of big sh set of shifts in our culture around how gender and sexuality are organized, what kinds of identities are possible, what ways of affiliating are possible, and we're right in the middle of it. Um, and and again, I think um, cinema, but also you know things like YouTube. And um, and Tumblr and um, and all these like different digital uh, ways of making audiovisual media are 
also participating in helping define those, but we're really in the midst of it and it hasn't kind of shaken out yet. And so I think the stakes are kind of high for, f um, you know, different people want things to, um, to be organized in different ways and they're, everyone's <laughs> kind of fighting to, to, um, to figure it out and get it to be the way that, is, that feels the most freeing for them, but there's not really any consensus about, about how that should be. Well, maybe um, ending with the present, the confused, but potentially gender exciting present. It's an exciting time, I think. We're living in exciting times. Yeah. Um, maybe that would be a nice way to end um, this evening. And um, this has been such a special evening for us um, in the series, both um, because Laura Horak is here, because we're thematizing um, cross-dressing, which as we see allows us to, to get at certain um, perverse desires and um, a kind of like playful asociality in Lubitsch's films. Um, and um, also because it was our premier event with Jerusa Miller. So please join me in thanking once again, Jerusa Miller. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have just one comment yes. uh, <laughs> yes. connecting to the movies uh, that in both of them, uh, Liebes Abetzi and Ich möchte kein Mann sein, uh, when they are taking the clothes off and say, oh, it's so hard to be a man. Yes, to, to do drag, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it really hurts. <laughs> Gender is painful. Gender is painful, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Jerusa, will you be appearing in Frankfurt in the near future? Can uh, people see you elsewhere? Uh, well, now in the middle of the July, it will be the last appearance, and then it's this, this summer. Uh, wo wo wirst du auftreten? Well, here, but how I said, because I'm the same person <laughs> in boy drag. But for, for the Leute, die, yes, die diese yes, Person dann noch yeah. mal sehen wollen. And uh, on the 15th of July, I'll be in a Fabrikfest. Fabrikfest? Yes, yes. This is, is uh, a fabric where this uh, ceramic was uh, produced in the in the past in Germany. Ah, okay. Wächtersbacher Keramik. I um, don't remember the name. Uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, yeah, I'll be there. Playing oh, for the whole day, actually. Oh, wow. Yes, okay. in, in many sketches of uh, 20 minutes. Ah, fantastic. So, yeah. so yeah, Sie haben die Gelegenheit, dann Jerusa nochmal zu erleben. And um, bitte, ich will nicht die Gelegenheit verpassen, nochmal uh, Laura Horak zu bedanken. So, thank you, Laura. Thank you. For your talk. Thank you. And then, ich hoffe, dass wir sehen um, einander wieder am um, 6. 6. Juli für Nenotschka mit einem Vortrag von Johannes von Moltke. Und du hast, glaube ich, von seiner Familie irgendeinen homosexuellen Skandal davon erzählt in deiner, deiner Rede. Ja, yeah, okay, so, so a very exciting uh, person will be coming and giving a talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.